the first episode of Radiant opens with the figure of a boy named Seth. On that peaceful day, Seth was enjoying the rooftop view of Pompo Hills, enjoying the bread he had just bought. After that, he meets his close friend, Tommy, and intends to show him his magical abilities. Seth brought the master's magic books, even without permission. His attempts to demonstrate his magical abilities with the book's guidance continued to fail. Finally, he tried to summon magic or Fantasia with his own Titan Punch move. Unfortunately, although Seth's magic this time worked, Titan Punch instead targeted a nearby farm, angering the herd of cows. Seth and Tommy run towards the village as the herd of cows chases after them. On the other side of the village, a witch named Alma is having a hard time in the market. A salesman refused to serve her because she was a magician. Finally, Alma had to threaten so that she could buy necessities from the seller. Then, she noticed a herd of cows entering the village and chasing after Seth. She used magic power to stop the herd of cows and make them line up neatly, and scold Seth for making such a mess. At the same time, the villagers of Pompo Hills saw the chaos and blamed Alma and Seth. They then quickly ran away after the villagers threw stones at Alma. Alma and Seth return to the house, which is a hot air balloon. As punishment, Alma orders Seth to clean the outer walls of the house. She then advised him to stop making a mess with his magic power. Alma, who seems to be like a mother and a teacher to Seth because she has taken care of him since childhood, advised him to focus on being a good person, not just being a magician. Seth was still curious about the villagers' attitude, who hated witches so much. Alma then explains that magicians are considered as dangerous as Nemesis, a disruptive monster falling from the sky. In the evening, Seth reads about Nemesis and is determined to become a great wizard to defeat them. That determination made him train even harder the next day. Tommy, an ordinary human, accompanies Seth to train even though his parents have forbidden him to be close to witches. Seth tells Tommy he will prove to everyone by becoming a Nemesis hunter. Seth's chance to meet Nemesis apparently came at that very moment. In the village, an egg-shaped Nemesis fell from the sky. The villagers demand Alma come to save them. But at that time, she was in another village to catch Nemesis, who was messing around. Seth realized that this was his fight. Seth brought Alma's magic equipment and came to the Nemesis. Meanwhile, Tommy warned residents to evacuate away. Seth's attempt to defeat Egg Nemesis failed, until finally, the egg-shaped monster broke, and a larger Nemesis emerged. Tommy saw Seth nearly lost, running to help him, but he was attacked by Nemesis instead. Seth tries to protect his friend even though he falls under Nemesis' body, almost being crushed to death. In a precarious state, a group of magicians suddenly came. The leader of the group, who introduced himself as the Bravery Quartet, managed to seal Nemesis before praising Seth's bravery. Don Bossman, the leader, trusted Seth to handle the Nemesis alone. He then intends to bring Seth into his group even though the villagers make fun of him and say he is useless. Seth is again faced with Nemesis and is confused when the Titan Punch move doesn't have any effect. On the other hand, Tommy is at the bank to meet his father when a member of the Bravery Quartet suddenly arrives and asks everyone to get out. Apparently, the Bravery Quartet seized the opportunity when Nemesis attacked the village to commit a crime. Returning to the village, Seth fails to tie Nemesis with chains, making Nemesis's power multiply and destroy the village. Alma returns to the village and sees the chaos that has occurred. At the same time, Seth heard screams coming from the bank and saw the Bravery Quartet robbery. Don Bossman thanks Seth, whom he assumes helped with the robbery by distracting Nemesis. The villagers of Pompo Hills believe that Seth is conspiring with the Bravery Quartet. Seth is angry when Don Bossman tries to pay him with the stolen money and beats the leader through the wall. He tells Seth there's no point helping ordinary humans, as well as how they are the same. But Seth refuses to be identified as a robber and tries to attack the other members of the Bravery Quartet, but Gigi manages to save the group. The Bravery Quartet finally leaves, leaving the citizens still bound and Seth having to defeat Nemesis, who is becoming stronger alone. He promised Tommy never to leave him. In the distance, Don Bossman was stunned to see Seth using the Fantasia Titan Punch with his bare hands. Seth finally weakened Nemesis, and Alma defeated it with a skull attack fantasy. After the fight was over, Alma asked Seth to go home. She treats his wounds and says she has caught the Bravery Quartet. She warns him not to use Fantasia with his bare hands. Seth expresses the desire to destroy all Nemesis. Alma then tells a tale about a Nemesis lair named Radiant. He gets even more excited to find Radiant, but she insists the place is just a fairy tale. The scene moves to a flashback to Alma and Seth's past. Alma first meets Seth at the hospital. At that time, she had just lost her memory in right hand. 
She took Seth with her until she finally had to leave him alone at home because she worked as a nemesis hunter. Seth, who was young, was bullied by other children. He received punches and kicks until his magic got out of control and exploded the area. The villagers catch and are about to kill Seth when Alma comes to save him. Alma was determined to take him to a safer place from that moment. They finally find a home in a hot air balloon. The grown Seth intends to embark on a journey to find the Radiant in the present. Although initially reluctant, Alma allows and gives him a broom and new gloves. She warned him not to become a monster. Their farewell was moving, but Seth still left with a wave of the villager's hand. On the other hand, there is an Inquisitor organization consisting of Von Tepes and Ulmina Bogliore as major Inquisitors. The organization group is led by a captain named Liselade and a colonel named Santori, the peak and general Inquisitor Torque, the Beast. The Inquisitors gathered to discuss a horned mage, who was none other than Seth. The moving scene shows an Inquisitor, Captain Dragunov, successfully capturing a magician and keeping him on the ship. Seth crashed the ship at that moment, so Captain Dragunov was about to catch him. He tried to fight back using magic against the Inquisitor. Captain Dragunov finally managed to catch him and lock him up. In captivity aboard, Seth meets a young witch named Melly and her childhood friend Mr. Boobry. Melly apparently headed to the Pompo village but got lost on the way until she was caught by Dragunov. She plans to retrieve the nemesis carcass. On the other side, there is Doc, a researcher from the Artemis Institute who has come to retrieve the nemesis carcass. However, he suffers the same fate as Melly and Seth and is imprisoned by the Inquisitor. Melly attempted to free them by telling Mr. Boobry to retrieve the key to the cage. Before leaving the ship after being freed, Seth took Doc and Melly to get their luggage. However, their actions were easily noticed by Captain Dragunov. A fight ensued, and Melly turned into another, more ferocious figure. She apparently has a curse, where when she is stressed, her personality turns fierce. Captain Dragunov manages to stop her, but Seth destroys the ship and manages to escape. After that, Seth, Doc, and Melly continue their journey toward Artemis Academy. Upon arriving at the city of Artemis, Seth was flabbergasted by the sheer number of magicians. Melly invited them to register as citizens of Artemis to use the city's facilities. According to Alma's information, Seth accepted the offer to meet Yaga, the strongest mage that was in Artemis Academy. Seth and his friends arrived at the town hall just as the welcoming ceremony started. The leader of Artemis Academy, named Master Lord Majesty, appeared on the stage and greeted Seth. He asked Seth and others to sign a contract. Seth agreed to sign the contract, not knowing that it was Master Lord Majesty's attempt to turn them into Artemis hunters. They were burdened with a huge debt by Master Lord Majesty. The debt increased every time they used the facilities in Artemis. Even though their debt continues to grow, Seth can live in peace and quiet with the protection of Artemis. Master Lord Majesty made sure they were safe from the Inquisitor. Even Dragunov said Artemis had 13 strongest magicians who made their security invincible. Knowing that Seth had entered Artemis, Dragunov returned to the base and informed the other members of the Inquisitor group that he had met Seth. He then explains that Seth can use Fantasia with his bare hands. Hearing that, the Inquisitor decided to capture Seth because of his great power. At Artemis, Seth finally meets the old wizard who is Yaga. Yaga is one of the 13 strongest magicians of Artemis. He refuses to provide information about Radiant because he thinks Seth is too weak and can't use Fantasia. Seth then asked Melly to teach him magic, but she could only do defensive magic when she wasn't in her other personality. Seth meets Doc at a cafe for help teaching magic. Doc refuses, but their conversation is overheard by Melda, the cafe owner, who is amazed by Doc's magical abilities. Doc is pleased to receive Melda's praise and agrees to teach Seth magic. He teaches how to use the meteor drop Fantasia, but Seth is having a hard time mastering this Fantasia. Melly's other personalities appeared and attacked Seth with meteor drops for him to imitate. But Melly's attack actually puts Seth in danger, making him finally manage to issue a meteor drop fantasy move. Yaga realizes Seth's abilities and decides to train him. He trains Seth very hard. When Seth finally has a chance to rest at the cafe with his friends, an octopus pulls Doc to the ground. Yaga explains that the octopus is not Nemesis but a witch's pet that was accidentally thrown into a water channel. Witches apparently often experiment with pets, and when the experiments don't go well, the animals are thrown away. This pet has different characteristics and traits, such as the one that kidnaps Doc apparently loves coffee. So Doc, who was drinking coffee at the time, was kidnapped. Seth intends to save Doc and uses coffee drinks to lure the octopus. 
but the octopus is tougher and manages to defeat Seth and Melly. Seth has his next plan to get inside the octopus and bring hot coffee. The octopus was weakened, but Doc stopped him when Seth was about to attack. They finally made peace with the octopus. Seth's practice with Yaga didn't stop. It just became more intense. Until finally, Seth broke the gloves he had. This disappointed Yaga, so he gave a special glove to him, which made him unable to use his Fantasia powers. Yaga did this because he thought that Seth had only focused on gathering Fantasia powers instead of trying to use them well. On the other hand, Master Lord Majesty called out to Seth and his friends. The huge amount of debt made them punished by cleaning the outer walls of Artemis Academy. While carrying out the punishment, Seth again meets the Bravery Quartet and its leader Don Bossman. The fight continued, but Seth was easily subdued due to Don Bossman's much more tough abilities. Don Bossman offers to help take off Seth's gloves, but with the condition that he forgets about the crimes the Bravery Quartet committed earlier. Seth refuses and manages to attack Don Bossman until he falls. However, he tried to save him and managed to remove the gloves from Yaga. Yaga notices Seth's actions and gives him another new gloves. The gloves, this time, allowed Seth to collect a lot of Fantasias, and his power increased many times over. On the other hand, Dragunov watches over Artemis when his ship gets caught in a storm. It was then that he saw the shadow of Nemesis, who could fly between heavy storms. But the Nemesis did not attack their ship but other ships. Dragunov inspected the ship under attack and noticed a large hole in the stern. Not only that, the ship apparently had a lot of magician captives. The captain of the ship asked Dragunov to repair the ship's damage. But after that, the Nemesis returned and headed to the nearest town. The ship captain didn't care about Nemesis's attack on the other city as long as he could still catch the magicians. Dragunov had another opinion and asked his troops to prepare for battle against Nemesis. The battle continued, but Dragunov did not manage to defeat Nemesis but only drove it away. He returned to the ship to capture the captain, who had caught the ordinary human instead of the magicians. Then Dragunov continued the mission. In Artemis, a festival is taking place. Doc asks Seth and Melly to participate in a broomstick race to earn money to pay off debts. But first, they needed money to register for the race. That's when a noble son named Nick came to Seth's group. Nick is the defending champion in the broomstick race at Artemis Academy. He mocks Seth's group and insults Alma. Seth is angry at Nick's insults to his mother and teacher and defies to beat him. If Seth won the race, Nick wouldn't insult Alma again. In the match, Seth uses the broomstick that Alma gave him. Meanwhile, Nick uses an expensive, more sophisticated broom. The game started, and Seth managed to get ahead of Nick. Unexpectedly, Master Lord Majesty came and attacked them. Seth then counterattacked. On the other hand, Nick speeds up until his friends fall, but Seth saves them. In the end, Nick wins the match, which makes Doc angry with Seth and Melly. On the other hand, another man named Grimm apparently intends to attack a city. The scene returns to Artemis Academy, where Doc tries to find a job to quickly pay off debts. That's when he finds a job opening to catch no-name Nemesis. Although Doc tries to hide the ad, Seth and Melly find it and force him to accept the job. While they were going to Nemesis, Dragunov found them and intended to contact General Inquisitor Torque, the Beast. Seth's group arrives at Rumble Town, where no-name Nemesis is located. Rumble Town was deserted and had no inhabitants, but they immediately found Nemesis. Seth and Melly tried to catch up and defeat the two Nemesis. The fight isn't over yet, and Seth sees more Nemesis going somewhere. It was then that Grimm appeared in front of him. A fight between Grimm and Seth ensues, even though Grimm is much stronger. Grimm saw the mess they made in the fight in Rumble Town. Finally, he chose to back off and advise Seth that they would meet again later. The existence of Seth's group is known to the Inquisitors, and they intend to capture them. The season 2 begins with a man named Seth and a woman named Alma heading to Cashley and Merlin using their flying house. As he descended the stairs, Seth was surprised by two wooden barrels that kept moving on their own. Upon being approached, the two barrels contained two men named Don Bossman and his subordinate named Gigi. It turned out that the two of them had been hiding there for a long time because they wanted to run away from Artemis. Soon afterward, Alma helps them escape in exchange for the two being willing to become her servants. Previously their group consisted of four men, but after being separated because of the fight, their group was only Don Bossman and Gigi. They also changed the name of the group to Bravery Duet. While having coffee together, Seth told Alma about the incident when he was in Rumble Town. He meets a man who looks like himself. The man has horns and knows his true strength. Besides that, Seth felt that he and the man had an inexplicable bond. 
Hearing this, Alma was surprised because she also felt that when he was fighting in Rumble Town, from a distance, she felt a very thick aura of malevolence. The next day, the house they were driving to arrive at the edge of the mainland was named Siphondir. Since the continent was quite dangerous, Alma only escorted Seth to the shore. Besides that, she also has a job to protect Pompo Hills from Nemesis attacks. As a farewell, Gigi gave a bag of food to Seth, while Don Bossman gave a broomstick without a wooden handle. After everything was ready, Seth left the house using a broom. Despite having difficulty controlling it, he still tried to ride it until he arrived at Siphondir Land. After flying for a while, Seth was hit by a flying boat belonging to a wealthy merchant who was about to vacation in Siphondir. Unfortunately, his food and broomstick were crushed by the propeller of the flying boat. Not long after, he saw a small boat coming out of the flying boat. He swiftly jumped towards the small boat. After arriving at Siphondir land, the merchants started to pitch their tents because of the rain. They talked about the struggle for territory filled with natural resources. Meanwhile, Seth, who was cold on the boat, tried to get down by jumping over the branches of the nearby trees. Unfortunately, he fell into the belly of one of the very fat male merchants. Because of that, he tried to explain what really happened to him just now, but none of the merchants believed him and thought he was a spy. Feeling cornered, Seth chose to run away from them. The merchant ordered his soldiers to chase him. He ran as hard as he could through the forest, but the soldiers kept chasing him. Finally, he fell into a hole and was saved by Grimm, who happened to be in Siphondir. After awakening from his stupor, Grimm and Seth talked that the events in Rumble Town were almost catastrophic. Since that incident, Seth didn't want to use his Fantasia against anyone else. Because the last time he felt angry, that enormous power appeared suddenly and was very difficult to control. On the other hand, the merchants who lost track of Seth held a meeting to discuss their plans at Cashley and Merlin, which would expand their business. Besides, they were actually the masterminds behind selling weapons to the Inquisitors. However, because of what happened in Rumble Town yesterday, the Inquisitors are no longer in control of the world. The merchants wanted to return their mines of wealth once again. The next day, Grimm escorts Seth down a path that leads to Cashley and Merlin's palace. Grimm told him not to go off the trail because Cashley and Merlin's castle was protected by powerful magic that could twist one's direction. If Seth was affected by that magic, he would be lost for months or even years. Seth began to walk through the forest until he finally managed to arrive at Cashley and Merlin's palace. There, he saw people who were cursed living, mingling with normal people, without any discrimination, like in Rumble Town. While looking around, Seth heard the sound of crowds of people. Out of curiosity, he approached the crowd of people. Soon, there were two men on horseback passing through the crowd. He asked one of the residents who the two men were. They even thought he was weird because they didn't know the famous witch knights named Mordred and Sagramore. Unexpectedly, Seth saw the presence of a woman named Melly in the crowd. After seeing him, she immediately turned around and left him. She was still angry that he wouldn't take her on this trip. After that, Seth decided to go to the night registration building and ask the female receptionist the information about Radiant. Unfortunately, she had no information about it. Even the current magic knights weren't looking for it anymore. Right now, they were more focused on dealing with the nemesis. She said the information about Radiant might have been in the historical records stored in the palace library. But to enter the palace, Seth had to have court connections or become an official palace member. Hearing that, he tried to register as a witch knight, but she immediately rejected him for no reason. After that, the guards dragged him away from there. Shortly afterward, Seth went to the middle of the forest while feeling confused about what he would do next. Unknowingly, he was standing under the statue of the Knight Merlin, the legendary witch of the continent. Although useless, he tried to ask the statue what he should do. Soon, a man named Mier appears. He confesses that he has the skills to sneak into palaces and has him disguised as a plant. Seth, intrigued, finally followed Mier to discuss their plans in a stable. On the way, Mier says that Merlin is just an old hermit, a rogue who smells as dirty and has a disheveled appearance. At the same time, they heard the sound of the palace trumpet, which was blown above the tower. Hearing this, Mier had to rush to take Seth to the stables. Arriving at the stables, Seth is kicked in by Mier and given a saddle and a password. In the cage, he is called by a woman who asks him to put the saddle on the body of the animal he will ride. The woman also gave him a magic stone, which gave rise to a cloak commonly worn by knights. When leaving, Seth was asked to leave his bag in the stables. After everything was ready, they flew to where the nemesis appeared and intended to fight them. In the sky, there are already many other knights who will go there. While in the air, the woman introduces her name, Akoho, a witch knight training student, and the animal they ride is called Dracoon. Arriving at his destination, Seth was surprised by something he had never seen before. Akoho explained that it was the creature they would fight called Spectral Nemesis. It was enormous and even bigger than the nemesis he had seen before. According to Akoho, there has been no effective attack against the creature. 
On the other hand, the group of knights was devising a strategy. Afterward, the group, led by Branguar, began to launch their attack. But as Akoho said, neither attack worked. It made Seth feel awkward because the nemesis in front of him had a different structure. It didn't have an eggshell, its shape only consisted of an array of light. While Seth was observing his surroundings, he suddenly hit one of Spectral Nemesis' tentacles, knocking him down. Luckily, Seth managed to land safely on a field, although he was hit by a coho. While in the fields, he had heard some complaints from the farmers who were ready to harvest their wheat, but now their fields were switched by the attacks of the Magic Knights. Seth could not bear to run to block the next attack. Finally, Akoho, who saw it, was touched and decided to help his plan to minimize the damage to the wheat field. Unexpectedly, the power of Fantasia released by Seth was overwhelming. Even without realizing it, he got sucked into the nearby Fantasias, causing the spectral nemesis to instantly disappear by itself. After the battle was over, Branguar and his group gathered. Some blamed Akoho for using magic on the mainland without asking permission first. Not long after, a woman named Queen Boudica appeared. Seth muttered that the size of her body was very large. The queen said she was there to see Spectral Nemesis in person, but she was too late because the creature had already disappeared. One of the male residents complained that they often saw Dulahans appearing in the village at night. The villagers were terrified every time they saw the creature walking with its own head in its hands. The arrival of the Dulahan is accompanied by the appearance of Spectral Nemesis. After hearing that, the queen returned home and was followed by a group of magic knights. Meanwhile, Seth, who saw Grimm's presence, chose to stay longer because he wanted to see Grimm. After the group left, Seth approached Grimm asking why he was posing like a scarecrow. Grimm said he wanted to gain something while keeping his distance from the world. He also said that he needed Seth's help to retrieve something from the palace. After that, Grimm took out a green cobblestone, which could store the memories of its owner. He wanted another stone that was stored in the palace library. Seth said he wanted to help him. After all, Seth felt he owed him a lot. Soon after that, Grimm gave information about the inn that Melly and Doc lived in. In the evening, Seth went straight to the inn said by Grimm to meet Melly and Doc. Once there, Seth apologizes to Melly for leaving her without any notice. He tried to explain why he did that, but she still asked him to leave her. All night Seth waited outside the inn in the rain. He thought about Melly's attitude earlier. Meanwhile, Doc, who felt sympathy for him, came out and explained what little he knew why she was behaving like that. After that, Doc went back inside, leaving him hungry and cold outside. Finally, Seth returned to the stables that Mier had shown him. Arriving at the stables, he sees Akoho training with Dracoon. The practice was interrupted when Akoho saw Seth standing in the doorway. Seth asked about the whereabouts of his bag earlier, which he had left there. Apparently, his bag is being used as a sleeping pillow by a woman named Lulu, who is in charge of taking care of Dracoon. He told Akoho that he wanted to enter Kashlian Merlin's palace to find information about Radiant in the archives that might be stored in the palace library. Hearing that, Akoho said she was willing to help him find information about Radiant. On one condition, he had to teach her defensive magic. Moreover, she advised him to stay in the stables for a while and sleep with Dracoon. At night, Seth always dreams about something strange. He often dreamed about a secret passage within the Kashlian Merlin Palace as if he knew very well about the palace. Not long after that, he woke up and saw Akoho talking to Mordred. At first, he thought it was the usual thing, but when she approached him, Seth felt a drastic change in Akoho, including the radiance of her eyes that changed. Afterward, Seth decided to go alone to sneak into the palace. Once there, he noticed how people were getting past the guards. After seeing the situation there, he felt that the palace guard was not as strict as he thought. Finally, he tried to enter the palace past the guard, but the guard asked for his name to be checked based on the guest list scroll. Seth, who felt panicked, immediately tore the roll of attendance list, then ran into the palace. Arriving at the palace hall, Seth realized that the wall there was similar to the one in his dream. He saw the exact same symbol as the one in his dream. When cornered, he entered a secret door unknown to the palace guards. Behind the door, he saw a very narrow road in front of him, but he kept walking down the street until he came to a room that looked awful. He saw that there was a nemesis that was similar to the spectral nemesis, only smaller in size. The creature was motionless in a glass tube. Not long after, someone came that Seth had to hide. But unfortunately, he was too late because the man named Diabal had already noticed his existence. Diabal took out his Fantasia to inspect Seth's body from afar. After that, Fantasia touched the horn on Seth's head, and Diabal suddenly felt scared. Diabal said that he wouldn't let Piotin kill him. Hearing this, Seth was surprised and wanted to ask him about Piotin. But Diabal, who thought he was Piotin, immediately locked him using a magic technique. Simultaneously, a specter similar to Seth appeared in the wheat field yesterday, followed by another spectral nemesis who suddenly appeared and directly attacked him using poison. 
Luckily, Seth finally managed to get out of the magic circle even though he had to be badly injured and unconscious. The incident was seen by Dragunov, who was with a female knight named Lieselot. On the other hand, Grimm saw it. They all headed straight for the wheat fields until they finally met and got into a fight with General Torku's two best subordinates. However, he prefers to run away than to continue fighting, and Dragunov hesitated to attack him. He knew that Grimm was a friend of Seth, who had saved many lives in Rumble Town. Dragunov would value the lives of others more than having to follow orders from his superiors. That's why, even though Grimm is a witch, he appreciates the service that Grimm has done in Rumble Town. Actually, when Dragunov was still an Inquisitor, he didn't have that much power. But after being appointed as Thaumaturge, he suddenly got a magical power different from magic because his power was still very mysterious. On the other hand, Grimm was teleporting to his base. Even though he escaped, he received injuries from the fight earlier. However, he can remove the wound using his healing magic. He was assisted by his subordinate, a man named Leo Gon, in cleaning the blood that fell on the floor. After that, Grimm planned to start his journey towards Siphondir and cross it from the starting point. In the palace's secret room, Seth, unconscious, was approached by two mysterious light figures. In his subconscious, he recalled all the events he had experienced, starting from his meeting with Alma, Meli, Hamelin, and Piotin. After that, a one-eyed black ball appeared. He thought that the ball was part of him. Afterward, he touched the one-eyed black ball until, unexpectedly, the black color became thick smoke enveloping his body. Seth shouted until he was heard by Meli, Doc, Akoho, and Mier. At the same time, black lines like Nemesis appeared all over Seth's body. He rose from his stupor and released a very powerful explosion of energy, resulting in a battle of two great powers between him and the two mysterious light figures. As a result of that fight, he was thrown out through the palace's wall. Luckily, Mier found Seth who was unconscious. He approached Seth, who was in Nemesis and turned him into his original form with strength. Afterward, Mier will bring Seth to his wife, Jill, to help with the healing process. The scene then shows Meli, Doc, and Akoho, who knew about the explosion, and now rushed to the place. Unfortunately, after arriving there, they were no longer find anything. Soon after that, Meli uses her powers to track Seth's Fantasia traces from afar. Her Fantasia headed towards the palace. However, she was unable to penetrate the defensive barrier in the palace. When Meli was about to head to the palace through the Kale Forest, Akoho immediately stopped her. Because if they pass through the forest, there is a possibility that they will get lost and will not be able to get out. Akoho said that if Kale's forest was protected by powerful ancient magic, even magic knights dared not enter. Even so, Meli still ignored her and continued walking towards the forest. Meanwhile, Doc and Akoho chased Meli until they finally entered the forest. Arriving at the Kale Forest, they realized they were lost and intended to return but the path they had taken earlier suddenly disappeared. During their panic, they meet Mier, who invites the three to meet Jill, but Akoho refused and said that they were looking for Seth. After that, Mier showed Seth's injured and unconscious body. With that, they were all willing to come with Mier to meet Jill. Doc, who is a researcher, during his journey, kept his eyes on the surroundings of the Kale Forest. He had seen the various species in a book, but it is mentioned that the species they see today have long been extinct. After a long walk, they finally arrived at a place and met Jill, who turned out to be a forest goddess. She has a large and tall body and is shaped like a tree. Seeing Seth's weak condition, Jill finally started the treatment immediately. Nier and Jill entered Seth's subconscious and saw him trapped inside the black ball. It turns out that Akoho can also use the magic used by Jill, then she brings Doc and Meli into Seth's subconscious. They tried to wake him up by reminding him of a few things. In his subconscious, Seth said he would stay in the forest and learn how to control power first. After that, he will come out of the forest. The next day, Akoho, Meli, and Doc walk out of the forest guided by a mushroom. On the way, they talked about the figure in the shadows of Cashley and Merlin's palace. They also speculated that there was a traitor among the magic knights. Meanwhile, Queen Boudicca summoned Brangwar and some of her subordinates into the palace. She explained that they would recruit a new leader of the knights named Lord de Gullies. On the other hand, Seth slept for three years. He is guarded by Mier and his wife and put in the sap of a healing tree. After he woke up, Mier started to explain everything, which made him feel very surprised. Seth panics because he hasn't contacted Alma in three years, and maybe she will kill him. Seth immediately rushed out of the forest, but Mier explains that the time inside and outside the forest is very different. No matter how long they were in the forest when they came out, they were still at the same time as when they entered. Hearing that, Seth became calmer. He instead asks Mier for help to teach him how to control his huge fantasia. Mier agrees to start training. He asked Seth to catch him. While running, Mier explained, in the forest, not only is the time difference, but the space also seems to be expanding. After practicing for a long time, they rested. 
While sitting down, Seth could finally open his senses to feel Fantasia filling the world and becoming one with it. Mir asked him to gather all of his Fantasia and push himself to the limit to remove the influence of Piotin that was in his body. But he still failed to dispel Poidon's influence despite being helped by Mir. Meanwhile, inside Cashlane Merlin's palace, the trumpet sounded again, which was a sign of the appearance of Nemesis. The witch knights, led by Brangwar, prepared to head to the outskirt farm location. When they got there, they saw a nemesis as a spider. Not long after that, Lord de Gullies slashed the nemesis to shreds. It made Brangwar feel annoyed that his plan to defeat nemesis had failed. After that, a very large short nemesis appeared, and many echo nemesis followed him, attacking the village. A large number of nemesis left the knights confused. Even Brangwar, who became the leader, couldn't do anything. Meanwhile, Akoho, who saw the incident, took out the last of her strength by using magic, took over the leadership of Brangwar by force, and made herself the center of control over the Witch Knights. Her move actually managed to defeat Nemesis. After all that was done, all that was left of the village was the destruction of the fields. At the same time, mysterious people came who were sent from rich merchants who gave the villagers two chests filled with gold to rebuild their village. Inside the secret room of the palace, Diebel was dealing with five mysterious figures of light. One of the figures of light reported that if merchants from across the country began to enter Cash Lane Merlin, they discussed taking action to expel the merchants. Besides that, Diebel asks about the progress of Seth's search, but the figure of light still can't find him. On the other hand, Seth was still training to control his strength. Slowly, he began to succeed in doing so. But it turned out to be difficult because sometimes if his body started to get tired, the darkness would return to cover his body. Luckily, Mier wants to accompany him to train. Moreover, Mier can also neutralize his condition. While taking a break, Seth asks who Mier really is. Mier replied that he was a fairy who was the last in the world. Hearing this, Seth just knew that the fairy was real. As a fairy, Mir can change shape and use Fantasia to survive. Seth also said that he sometimes feels immersed in Fantasia, whether he is a fairy. Hearing that, Mir laughed out loud because there was no way Seth, who had scary powers, was an elf. After that, Seth returned to training but lost his body again. He began to recall the image of the people who had accompanied him. Because of that, he also has the strength and determination that can be used to control his Fantasia, which has been out of control. Mier says Seth finally managed to tie up the stowaway in the Sea Realm. Now he can use Fantasia to create, not just destroy. Because previously, he could only destroy it. After he felt that he had practiced enough, Seth packed his things and said goodbye to go out of the woods to Jill. Seth returned to Cashley and Merlin's palace to look for information about Radiant. Jill said that he might be the one who could be the fairy's hope in the future. On the other hand, Merlin Palace was going to hold a Magic Night Inauguration Festival. To give her best appearance, Akoho is assisted by Meli and Doc to bathe Dracoon. While rubbing Dracoon's tail, Doc invites Meli to return to Artemis. But Meli refuses because she wants to be there until the celebration happens. Meli instead tells Doc to go home alone. Hearing this, he was annoyed, saying if he knew the place was dangerous, he would never want to come to Cashley and Merlin. After that, she replied that she had never told him to go there. After they go home, Mordred comes to Akoho's place and invites her to talk. Meanwhile, Meli, who was on her way home, felt something strange there. She felt Brangwar had watched her every day, even as she walked home. She ran and hid to watch Brangwar come back from behind a haystack. Not long after, Akoho walked out wearing a cloak while Brangwar followed behind her. Afterward, Meli followed the two of them from behind, but she accidentally bumped into Lord de Gullies, who teased her on the way. Having lost track of her, Meli asks Doc and Mr. Boobry to go first. It turned out that Akoho went in front of the Cashlian Merlin Palace. Arriving there, she squatted down while touching the ground. Suddenly Brangwar came and wanted to attack her from behind. Luckily, Mr. Boobry threw Doc's body towards Brangwar, so his attack stopped. Afterward, he approached Doc with an angry face and accused him of blocking his action. Just as Brangire was about to attack Akoho again, Meli came and locked him in a magic tube. Brangwar explained that Meli had misunderstood him. Because according to him, Akoho is the cause of all the appearances of specters. At the same time, Akoho attacked Meli from behind but was stopped by Seth, who suddenly appeared. When he saw Akoho's eyes, Seth felt the look in her eyes that he had seen before. Akoho, who felt cornered, chose to leave using a broom. Brangwar, Seth, and Meli immediately chase after her while they forget Doc, who is still behind. In the wheat field, two farmers who happened to be outside the house screamed in fear after seeing the silhouette of the flying Akoho. They thought that she was the vengeful Dulahan. If her figure appeared, there would be specters coming. On the other hand, Seth is using his newfound power to search for Akoho's whereabouts through the information provided by nature until he finally finds her. Seth immediately hugged her from behind to wake her up and stop her actions because she was summoning Spectre Nemesis. 
At the same time, Meli and Brangwar came accusing Akoho of being a traitor and a liar. Brangwar admitted that he had been observing her suspicious movements for a long time. But Akoho, with a guilty and confused face, explained that she didn't know what was happening and what she was doing. Besides that, she also says there is a mark on her neck that makes her will follow whatever they say if it gets pressed by someone. After that happened, she won't remember anything she did. It turns out that the mark is a curse for her. To prove her words, Brangwar presses the mark and tells her to kill herself. Instantly Akoho's eyes changed, and she pointed a knife at her own neck. Seeing this, Brangwar immediately stopped her until she regained consciousness. Finally, he frees her and asks her to return to the palace. He promises that he will not let anyone know about her curse. However, Brangwar would refuse Akoho's inauguration because she could easily be used by others. After that, Seth and Meli return to pick up Doc on a broomstick. On the way, Seth shows a stone that has a lot of Fantasia and can be used to activate projection magic, thus spawning Spectre Nemesis. He felt that Fantasia inside the rock was similar to his own, so he remembered Diebel's presence in a hidden room within the palace. Akoho, who heard that, said that as a child, she had infiltrated the palace more easily when the palace was holding an inauguration celebration. On the other hand, Dragonov and Lisalot were on their way to the merchant's campsite. As he continued walking, she asked him why he looked so gloomy when he received a direct order from General Torku to arrest Seth. When Dragonov was appointed as Thaumaturge, he did not show such an expression. She expressed her suspicions that there was a possibility that Dragonov would not follow Torku's orders and prefer to follow his conscience. If that happened, Lisalot would punish him. Arriving at the merchant's camp, Dragonov inquired about the reason the two of them had been summoned there. One of the merchants said they would talk about a weapon that could eliminate Fantasia that the witches had. He discussed the attack on Cash Lane Merlin because the merchants wanted to kill all the witches on the Siphondir continent. Because if Siphondir is destroyed, their authority will recover after being damaged by the incident in Rumble Town. In essence, these merchants cooperated with the Inquisitor to subdue Cash Lane Merlin. On the other hand, Akoho suspects that Mordred has used her curse to bring forth Spectre Nemesis. So, to find out the truth, she goes to Mordred's room and knocks on it. Not long after, Mordred opened his bedroom door and invited her to come in. As Akoho is walking in, Mordred tries to press the sign, but she notices it and attacks him. She said that she had given her life for Siphondir and his people. When cornered, Mordred explained his reasons for doing so. If he knew a group called the Hermit Group who continued to maintain Merlin's majesty. A group wants to use the Akoho curse to eliminate the magic knights who betrayed Merlin. However, since Mordred doesn't want Akoho to become an assassin, he uses her to summon Spectre Nemesis. Akoho did not believe his explanation and would report the incident to the Queen. But Mordred says that it will be useless because if people want to become members of the Hermit, then that person must swear allegiance to the Queen. According to Mordred, the Queen is the mastermind behind everything that happened to her. The day of the Magic Knight's inauguration ceremony had arrived. Meanwhile, Lisalot and Dragonov had arrived inside Kashli and Merlin's palace. For the sake of the smooth running of their mission, they disguised themselves by wearing witch costumes. On the other hand, Seth and Doc sneak into the palace library. He asks Doc to find out about Radiant and the items Grimm ordered. Meanwhile, Seth will find an entrance to Diebel's hideout. When the sacred inauguration began, Akoho stated clearly in front of all those present that it was the queen who had controlled the nemesis Spectre and led a group of so-called hermit followers. The group's headquarters was in the heart of the palace. Hearing her accusation, the witch knight leaders started to get angry, including Lord de Gullies, who immediately drew his weapon and jumped to slash her. Luckily, Brangor came and resisted Lord de Gulli's attack. He said that what Akoho said was the truth. He agreed with what his students said. During the commotion, one of the guards suddenly fell in front of the queen with his clothes torn and his body covered in wounds. The guard said the Inquisitor had attacked them. Hearing this, Queen Boudicca lifted her sword and drew it on the floor. She said that this is the day when they must strengthen their bond as the people of Siphondir. The enemy has set foot on their land, and the blood of their brethren has been spilled. Once again, she raised her wand and invited everyone to destroy the arrogant Inquisitor. She will take care of the internal affairs of Cash Lane Merlin's palace after this battle. Meanwhile, in the forest of Kaelt, Mier, Jill, and their unborn children seem to be living in peace. Suddenly Mier senses something bad will happen, so he says goodbye to Peek outside the forest. But only a few steps away, he stopped and looked back at his wife and future children once again. After that, he really left the forest. In the Cashley and Merlin Palace, there was a commotion among the residents. They all panicked at the arrival of dozens of large ships from the Inquisitors flying above Siphondir's sky. The guards directed them to go to the dungeon to minimize anything bad. After that, the guards headed to the battlefield. On the other hand, Meli saw the palace troops about to fight. Just as she was about to leave, Dragunov suddenly came and stopped her. Meli is brought by Dragunov to inquire about Seth's whereabouts. 
On the other hand, the Inquisitors led by Santori and Almina were ready to attack. A woman named Veron said they dared to attack Siphondir and Cashlane Merlin because they had a tool given to them by rich merchants. The tool can eliminate Fantasia, the main power witches possess. While waiting for the message sent by the Inquisitor, the Thaumaturges continued their conversation. In front of the palace, the messenger had arrived. The witch knights led by Queen Boudicca accepted their arrival. The messenger said they were the people appointed to carry the message of peace. The Inquisitor wanted the entire population of Siphondir to surrender. They read out five reasons why the Inquisitor came with a full army, where four of them are slander that is not proven true. Hearing this, Queen Boudicca confirmed that she was the queen of the region. She asked the messengers to bow down and relay the message she was about to say. She wanted them to go back to their mother. Otherwise, their corpses will be piled up as high as the sky. Afterward, she got angry and threw the messenger carrier flying back into the face of the Inquisitor's army. Inside the palace, Seth is re-exploring the palace's secret rooms, and he doesn't know if there is a war out there. He goes to that place to meet Diebel and learn the truth about the mysterious Piaden. Shortly after, Diebel came and directly attacked him. However, his attack failed after Seth managed to stop Diebel's illusion magic. After confronting him, Seth was a little surprised because he saw that there was a horn on his head. Diebel explained they might be brothers. In the palace library, Doc is still looking for information about Radiant. He finds a book with oddly small writing. The book was able to answer all of his questions using a tool attached to the cover. He asked again about Radiant in the book, showing page 10. He opened it slowly, but the pages were torn. Diebel tells Seth that he still has another brother named Triton. Besides that, Diebel said that he did not know who Piaden was and what he was after. He only knew that Piaden was a fantastical creature. Diebel said he was once captured by the Inquisitor and sentenced to death, but he was saved by Piaden. However, the longer he was with Piaden, he felt that he was only used as a fighting tool by Piaden. One day, Diebel followed Piaden but he lost track at the Vivisign. There, he even met a witch named Triton, who had the same ability. Diebel tells Seth that a witch is generally created because they survived contact with Nemesis, so it doesn't pass down to his family. But unlike Diebel and Seth, according to him, they are both direct descendants of a witch who can produce offspring of a witch as well. In other words, they have been witches since birth, very different from the other witches. And that's why the Inquisitors desperately searched for and captured the Horned Witches. Those who have been witches since birth have the power to change the world. The scene then shows in the battlefield where Queen Boudicca said they would not share their land with strangers, just as Merlin had done. Akoho, who saw the Queen was at the forefront, asked her to back off. However, the Queen refused and said that the front line was the safest place. She learns that her army is treasonous and provides information to the Inquisitor and the rich merchants. The angry queen uses the memory stone to bring out the kings of the past and help her fight the enemy. Simultaneously, dozens of Inquisitor's large fleet ships came forward to attack, but the queen brandished her wand. Instantly the sky darkened and filled with black clouds that emitted lightning to destroy most of their fleet of ships. In an instant, the ships fell and were out of sight. Seeing that, the members of the witch knights felt happy and excited. Some of them even advanced to the front line to enter enemy territory. Suddenly the flying witches fell, and magic attacks couldn't penetrate where the Inquisitors were. It happened because they had a tool to wipe Fantasia within a predetermined radius. Knowing that, Akoho tried to tell the night leaders not to send more troops, but no one believed her words. Even Mordred, Sagramor, and Lord de Gullies continued to move forward. Seeing this, Akoho decided to follow them. On the other hand, Diabal and Seth were still having a conversation. Diabal explained that he was hiding in Cash Lane Merlin because he had been tortured and had run away from the Inquisitors. But the previous reason he was arrested was because Piaden handed him over to the Inquisitor. After escaping, Diabal blinded his eyes because he knew that Piaden could see through Diabal's eyes. He hid there because the palace was protected by ancient magic, so any magic that came from outside could not enter it. Hearing that, Seth took Diabal to find out about their whereabouts. He agreed and was taken to the witching realm by Seth. When he entered the magical realm, Diabal was surprised because he thought that the realm was just a legend. There, Seth tried to call Mier to ask something, but after calling him several times, he never came. Instead, Seth heard Akoho's voice telling him that a war was going on outside. The Inquisitor had attacked them. After getting that information, Seth finally decided to bring Diabal back to the realm of the world. He invites Diabal to help him fight the Inquisitor's attack, but Diabal refuses because he fears Piaden's presence. Diabal simply gave a stone and gave it to Seth to put it in the enemy base. Meanwhile, Diabal will summon Spectra Nemesis. Hearing that, Seth agreed, then left and said he would return to meet Diabal after the war was over. Shortly afterward, Seth kept running through the halls until he finally got outside and saw something horrific. Suddenly Mr. Boobry approached him and told Melly's condition. Knowing its meaning, Seth immediately ran and looked for her whereabouts. 
but on the way he was stopped by Dragunov, assigned to arrest him. On the other hand, Modred, Sagramor, and Lord de Gullis arrived aboard the merchant's ship. They went to that place by order of Queen Boudicca, but that was just an excuse used by Mordred to be able to bring the two best troops so that the merchants could weaken Cashlan Merlin. After saying that, a merchant grabbed Mordred's shoulder and thanked him. It turned out that the merchant was his biological father. Soon afterward, the merchants caught Akoho, who followed them while using the net. Brangor told the queen that many of their troops had died on the battlefield, while they cannot hurt the enemy at all. On the other hand, Thaumaturges began to expand the radius of Fantasia's erasing machine. This caused the forest to dry up, including the Kelp Forest. The heir, who saw it, felt very angry, especially in the dry forest there was his wife and future children. On the other hand, the queen began to realize the source of their defeat was because a machine tried to run and continued to break through the enemy troops. Even though her body continues to be fired upon by the cannon, she keeps running and targets Fantasia's erasing machine to destroy it. Unfortunately, just as the queen was about to arrive, Santori managed to stop her with the power of a miracle. In front of the queen, Santori arrogantly said she was more stupid than her troops because she kept running and let her body be attacked. Unexpectedly, she stood up again and threw the shield, causing the machine to crash and stop. That incident made Thaumaturge panic. Because along with the cessation of the machine, the magic power of Fantasia will return again. Santori, who saw that, was angry and immediately attacked the helpless queen. Arrogantly, Santori said that their victory was guaranteed by kidnapping the queen. While on the ship, there was a fight between Sagarmore and Mordred, while Lord de Gullis fought a male merchant named Christorm. Because of his cunning, Mordred managed to stab Sagarmore right in the head so that he was killed. Mordred tells Akoho that his curse is he has no emotions. After saying that, he stabs Dracoon, suppressing Akoho's curse and telling her to jump off the ship. On the other hand, Dragunov and Seth were walking in the middle of the forest. He tells Seth to follow him if he wants the war to end. But when they reached the hill's edge, Seth again saw an even more terrifying sight. Even Dragunov, who was currently looking at him, felt extremely surprised. Dragunov assures Seth that he will stop the war. Shortly after, Dragunov shot his arrows into the air and gave information if the Horned Witch had been caught. With that, the war suddenly stopped. Seth was escorted by Dragunov, walking through the crowd of witches. But Seth instead received insults from the knights and residents of Siphondir as if he was the one who was the most guilty of that incident. However, when Seth connected with the Spectra Nemesis, he restrained it from minimizing the damage. Dragunov realized that too, but still, Seth chose to accept whatever people said about him. Just as Seth gave up on the situation, a very large warship appeared behind the black clouds. Seth and Dragunov were shocked, especially Dragunov. He hopes that by bringing the Horned Witch, he will stop the war. But it turned out to be all just a mistake. The warship fired many cannons toward the palace though it didn't work due to the ancient protective magic. But still, the shock caused by the attack made the residents feel more panicked. Some of the witch knights who wanted to help were even stopped by Varon by using her bell power to turn humans into stone and turn them into dust. Seth, who saw what happened, was angry with Dragunov for breaking his promise, but Dragunov could not answer. He felt that he had been betrayed by General Torku. Seth decides to be directly involved in the war, while a guilty Dragunov chooses to help him go to the battlefield where Santori is. When Dragunov is surrounded by other Inquisitors, two men from his former subordinates appear. They will give their allegiance to him. On the other hand, the witch knights informed their leader that something at high speed continued to move from within the palace toward the center of the battlefield. Meanwhile, Seth, heading to the battlefield, continued to attack the Inquisitor soldiers one by one. The goal is to face Santori. Seth fought him using demon mode, which he could already control. But in the middle of the fight, they were surprised by something suddenly appearing. It was Doc, who was in black armor. He tells Seth that he managed to get all the memory stones that Grimm wanted. But when Doc is about to leave, he is almost found by the guards, so he hides in the armor. However, the memory stones he took suddenly turn on and alternately take over the armor's movement. After that, Santori launches an attack on Seth and Doc, but Doc managed to stop him with just one hand. Not long after, a fight broke out between them, making Santori cornered and fall asleep. On the other hand, the Inquisitor's army surrounded Queen Bodica, who was guarded by the exhausted Brangwar. Afterward, Doc comes in his armor and intends to take the Queen to a safer place. However, before he had time to do it, Varon came and pretended to be a lost child on the battlefield. She launched an attack, and Doc managed to avoid it. He tries to attack Varon with full strength, but when his sword passes through her magic circle, everything turns to stone and just shatters. The armor occupants continued to look for gaps to penetrate Varon's circle. Suddenly, Doc told them to stop because he had an idea. At first, the occupants of the armor don't want to do it, then he bites their memory stone, so they are forced to stop. 
and for the occupants of the armor to obey him, Doc must threaten them by swallowing the memory stone. He asks the occupants of the armor to take out all of their biggest fantasias at once. On the other hand, Seth and Santori still fought while giving their all. As Seth struggled with Santori's growing body, he took out a projection stone and summoned Diabal, who instantly came out in spectral nemesis form. However, because Santori already knows the secret, he can instantly eliminate Spectra. While praising Seth, Santori continued walking towards him, who was already lying down. Seth, tired of hearing Santori's nonsense again, took out his entire Fantasia. After fully attacking him, Seth fell back down because he felt weak, and Santori disappeared somewhere. Meanwhile, Doc and Veron are still fighting. Doc is still trying to attack her body with strong protective powers. Finally, all the Fantasia released by the occupants of the armor turned to stone due to Veron's magic and buried the owner of its power under the rock he created. Unfortunately, the war is still not over. Suddenly the witches feel the disappearance of Fantasia from the forest, and Veron, who was still alive, managed to escape. Fantasia's disappearance from the forest was due to Almana placing Fantasia's eraser machine in the forest. She casts her magic and brings back the dead to life. She uses corpses as puppets of her powers. On the other hand, Seth was already surrounded by the corpses controlled by Almana. When he wanted to finish everything, he felt Fantasia, who was in the forest, begin to disappear. Hurrying up, Seth headed for the forest where Jill was. While heading there, Seth saw the trees had been scorched, and no plant was left. In the middle of the forest, he met Mier, who was crying for Jill. Even their unborn children became victims of the war. Mier had once been angry and wanted to destroy humans, but Jill held him back. And this time, there would be no stopping him from doing it because Jill was dead. The enraged Mier turned into a giant, and at the same time, the shackles on Seth's body shattered, causing him to lose control again. Two of the most terrifying creatures transformed in the same place, so Fantasia's explosion was no longer inevitable. They headed to the battlefield in demon-like forms. Using his power out of control, Seth managed to blow up the Inquisitor's fleet of ships with great ease. In the forest, Akoho, Branguar, and Meli, who were already near Fantasia's erasing machine, kept trying to destroy it. Sadly, whatever they do, it's completely useless. And finally, Queen Boudica, with the last of her strength, got up and stopped the machine with her own body. Shortly after the machine was destroyed, Dragunov came in front of the queen and offered to take Meli to where Seth was in Almana's clutches. Meli tells Dragunov that Grimm was the first person to stop Seth during his rampage. With that, he brought her first to where Grimm was. Arriving there, Grimm is initially suspicious of Dragunov's arrival, but after Meli explains everything, Grimm finally agrees to help with their plan. On the other hand, Seth was in Almana's grip and made her lulled with her words. While Omina was hugging Seth, suddenly Grimm came, accompanied by Meli, grabbed his body, and left him. Shortly after, Veron arrives and tells Omina to back off as Fantasia's erasing machine has been destroyed. Moreover, Santori disappeared. But the Inquisitor's decline did not go smoothly. Mier, who was angry, came and slaughtered the remaining Inquisitor's remnants. The witches who saw that were happy because they thought Mier was Merlin's messenger, but they were wrong. Mier angered not only the Inquisitor but all of humanity and with his creator's power, Mier attacked the witches and residents. Meanwhile, Meli tries to contact Seth through the sea realm. Thankfully, she can resuscitate him. Seth, who had woken up, rushed downstairs to meet Mier and calm him down. But Mier doesn't want to, because he doesn't accept that Jill and her children are victims of conflict and human activities. His tantrum stopped when Seth came with his children, who were still able to be saved. Doc found his children under the protection of Jill's dead body. After Mier returns to his small form, he talks to Seth and his friends. Mier tells Siphondir's true history and who the legendary witch Merlin is. Turned out that Merlin is Mier, and the history of Merlin, who said that he would not divide the land, was his words that became the misunderstanding of mankind. Even the names written by history are different because his name is not Merlin but Mirrodin. Three days after the war ended, Seth met Mier, who sang a sad song while playing guitar in the middle of his destroyed house. Seth apologized that if he had not come to Siphondir, then the Inquisitor would not have invaded the continent. After that, Seth left Mier alone as he sang a sad song for Jill. When Seth meets the queen, he is given a memory stone that Grimm wants. At the same time, Nellie is given a souvenir from the finest craftsman at Cash Lane Merlin's palace. While Doc was given the title of Witch Knight, he didn't want it, because all he wanted was money that he could use to pay his debts at Artemis. Shortly afterward, Brangwar gives a black armor stone to Doc because only he can use it. Moreover, now inside his body were several memory stones from the former commanders of the previous Witch Knights. The anime ends with the departure of Seth, Doc, Meli, and Okoho. Even after going through all that, they still couldn't get any information about Radiant. This is the end of the anime. The moral that can be learned from this anime is that war only causes harm to both sides. Even innocent people will be affected.